Okay, hello, good day everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel, if you know my Mavericks, my name is G2, and right now we have a really, really special guest right now, straight from the U.S., that's all oh, welcome, filmmaker Kevin Thorne. Hi everyone. So Kevin, how's it going? How are you, by the way? It's going good. Uh, happy to be able to talk to you about uh, some of the stuff we've got going on, so I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. Okay, wow, that's really uh, good to hear, Kevin. So, uh, a few questions from our viewers is, um, when did you first realize that uh, you wanted to be a, a filmmaker? And, can you share the moment or experience that sparked your passion for this craft? Mm -hmm. So, uh, despite a lot of my peers, uh, I figured out I wanted to do filmmaking much later than everyone else. Um, it wasn't until after I graduated high school that... Um, I ran into someone that was working on a project and I helped them out. Um, so I'd probably say I was about 19, 20 years old and they asked me to be a production assistant on their like film noir that they were making. And so I had set up where I would work from around seven in the morning to about noon or one o'clock. And then I work on the film from about one thirty to midnight. And I did that for about two weeks straight and it wasn't until like around the fourth day I was sort of laying down in the green room with eating a burrito and I was like really tired but I noticed that even though I was really tired I was having a lot of fun and I think that was kind of the moment that I was like you know this is what they mean when you're doing something you enjoy is that even though you're really tired you know there's just something about it that that keeps you going you're like I'm just I want to keep going keep doing this so I'd say that's around um, when I discovered that and then realized, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to keep doing this. That's really uh, something uh, exhausting, however, since you like what you're doing, you just can't uh, feel the exhaustion, right? Or the, you know, being tired. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been doing this for how long now? Um, I'd probably say it's been at least eight years, I think, of me doing this full-time. I work as a freelancer full-time, technically. So um, my work schedule is essentially whenever something falls on my lap. So sometimes I'll work, you know, Monday, Tuesday, nothing, Wednesday. And then I'll work, you know, Thursday through Sunday or won't do anything for a week. And then sometimes I'll work for 10 days in a row. Um, so it's, it's really sporadic, but, you know, I have to be ready all the time. I can't make plans because if I make plans, I'll get a call uh, for some I'll get a call from someone that wants me to work that day that I make a plan, so. That's basically 24-7. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. Um, there was one, I'd say near the end of last year, I worked 22 days in a row. So it was, it, it gets, it can get cr crazy. <laughs> I, I got to experience me on TV. I've been there on the set for about uh, hours, just, wait, just waiting for my uh, line to uh, shoot. Is it also uh, the same thing in the, uh, on your case? Yes. So essentially, um, when a lot of people talk about kind of working, at least um, standard jobs, it's kind of like an eight-hour, nine-to-five situation. Um, but in the filmmaking world, your days are splits, or you kind of break, break your days down as like 10-hour or 12-hour days. And those are your standard days. Um, and then it's overtime after that. And you you can always kind of expect overtime a lot of times. So when you're like you know, negotiating a rate, like you're already putting in that you're going to be working 12 hours and then chances are going to work on top of that. So 14 to 16 hour days is, um, we wouldn't, you know, a lot of people wish it wasn't common, but it, it happens a lot more than others would, most people would realize. So what if you're into something uh, like, uh, you know, you're on your personal uh, time and then someone called, mm -hmm. you have to uh, attend that uh, <laughs> call or... Yeah, it's uh, so it's it's a weird sort of dance in the fact that, uh, and this is why I say as a freelancer, I don't work whenever I want. I work whenever I can, because essentially, it's it's filled with a lot of people that are uh, essentially like hiring managers. You know, they're looking for people to fill spots for jobs that they get coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, I work um, 
lately I've been working a lot as a sound mixer. So, you know, there's people in um, a certain area or a certain market that they, a company reaches out to them and says, I'm working on a commercial or a documentary. I need a sound mixer for these days. And so that's when I'll get the email. And usually if they'll send it out and then I almost have to say yes, because the more times I turn it down, the more they get a job in and go, well, I can't reach out to this guy because he's never available. So I'm just going to start reaching out to someone else. So it's almost like I have to always be ready for them because if I'm not, then I start going down the priority list of people they contact to, to do this work. Yeah, that's the, I don't want to say uh, downside of it, but uh, you almost have to say yes. For the yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah, I think downside, it's, it's a, it's a negative, it's not like really bad, but it is definitely something that, why I, I can't really make plans on the weekend, because if I do, I get a call that they want me on that weekend, I gotta, I usually almost 100% of the time drop the plans and I do the job instead. Mm, so you've been doing this uh, professionally, correct? Yes. So, um, yeah, so I do it soon. I basically work in every field, uh, sports broadcast, commercial, documentary, and, and creative film. Uh, and I've done a few features, traveled for those. Um, there's one, uh, Reveille, uh, I think it's on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Uh, it's a World War II film. That was one of the first larger films I worked on. Um, and I was the sound mixer on that. So, you know, we had firearms experts, German and American like experts going in and I was micing up the soldiers and we had firearms and you know, the works I'd say that's uh, probably the most immediately um, available film you can see. There's a lot of things you work on that. Like they don't come out for a really long time. <laughs> so I start to lose track on when, uh, who, who did, uh, when I did what or where it's at in the process. Cause sometimes it'll be in editing for like years. Oh my, uh, so the editing takes about years to uh, finish? Yeah, so I, I think the turnaround for a lot of people, um, they try to keep it under a year, but it's, I, I feel like it averages between like one and three years for, for some stuff. I, I mean, honestly, every role sort of has its own challenges. Essentially 50% video, 50% audio. And the important thing about the audio aspect that a lot of people don't realize is that when you're watching something, people can tolerate um, like a blurry video as long as it sounds good. But you can have something that looks really good, but if it doesn't sound good, then 90% of the time they're going to, you know, turn it, stop watching it. Yeah. So and, and that's, I kind of say it sounds a little bit more important than video, but for, for the fairness of the camera guys out there, I'll keep it 50-50. Yeah, uh, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, sometimes uh, I can tolerate the video being blurred. And the uh, audio being uh, doesn't sound that good. But well, I guess if you are really interested in what you're watching, you know, really don't care sometimes if the video is not good or the you know audio, right? <laughs> yeah, there's there's a good window of it, and you know it doesn't have to be pristine, um, which is why like there's thousand dollar microphones out there, but um, you'll find a lot of content filmed on these small little like square mics that they'll pin on themselves. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the mic position is more important than the mic itself. So, you know, that, that, that's really all it takes is it just doesn't sound bad. It doesn't have to sound great, but it just ha can't sound like really bad. Okay. So, uh, Kevin, uh, what's the difference between, you know, if you are uh, using a $1,000 mic versus the, the one that uh, you've been talking uh, earlier, the square mm -hmm. little microphone? Um, I'd say, like, um, in, in the realm of audio, um, it's it's all about mic placement uh, more so than uh, mic quality. It's really, it, it, with most things, there's a diminishing return with the money you spend and like the better quality you get. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason a lot of people, like I, the, I purchased the mics in my kit that I have is because um, durability is, is a surprising factor you need in the professional world. Right. Um, just because you're constantly bringing stuff everywhere, you need it to last. And the second one is just like the frequency uh, spectrum that it captures. A lot of the cheap stuff, you know, um, they, they don't get as much as the low end or the high end. The clarity uh, doesn't pick up as much. Um, but it doesn't matter how expensive the mic is. If it's not in a good spot, then it's, you know, <laughs> not going to sound good. I, I'd say if I could, it's like um, on the camera side, it's like you can have a nice camera, but if it's not framed well, you know, it doesn't look good. Same with a mic. You can have a nice mic, if it's not positioned well, it won't sound good. Oh, 
Oh yeah, that's a good explanation. Yes. By the way, Kevin. So you mentioned earlier that uh, you've been doing on uh, sports, uh, some commercials, and movies. On all of those <laughs> uh, uh, three types of uh, shooting that uh, you've been making, which one is the most difficult one? A uh, documentary, um, uh, probably because um, there's a lot of times, especially for uh, in both aspects that I've done. Do- I'd say documentary is the most difficult because. Uh, because it's unscripted, it's unpredictable. And a lot of the times there's, there's producers that don't want to see uh, from a sound mixer, uh, sound mixer's perspective. I'll go from there at least. And sometimes they don't want to see the microphone. And when the mic isn't exposed, you have to mount it on the inside of the shirt or kind of like on the chest. And there's a slew of problems that can go, whether or not, whether it's the mic rubbing against something or the fabric of the clothing is thick and the voice kind of gets muffled. And um, because it's unscripted, they're always doing stuff and sometimes you only get one chance. So if the mic isn't a good, in, in, is not in a good spot and my boom mic isn't in a good spot, uh, it's just kind of like they take it ruined. And sometimes they get a little active. So it's, documentary is just, just just the nature of it is difficult because it's unscripted. So you can't just ask to do it again. And film, you, I can totally just bring up like, hey, like there was a train that went by. So it was hard to hear the voices. But in a documentary where like someone's having a moment and they're trying to capture that, uh, capture the essence of that moment, it's, you know, you can't just say like, oh, can you, can you tell me that really personal story one more time? It was... It's kind of kind of didn't sound as great. So there's like no point of return uh, at that very moment. Yeah, you can't. It, it's uh, wedding filmmakers kind of feel that a lot too because it's you know it's basically one one chance to get capture this moment. Uh, in, in a documentary, like it's a lot. Usually, little things like someone like walking up to a door or someone's just you know sitting there looking out in the distance, you can kind of redo. But like confrontations or um, things of that nature, it's it's one and done. You only uh, have to do it once, and that's it. Yeah, I'd say the a very stressful moment is, like, um, it was a documentary for, like, Discovery, um, and it had to do with a guy that was confronting someone that he believed had murdered his daughter. Um, and so we mic'd him up, and, you know, can't have a cable to him, because, you know, we're, like, a hundred yards away, like filming him, like super far away. And they're trying to listen in and the mic had cut out from some sort of interference. And, you know, you can't have this guy re redo confronting this dude, this guy, this supposed, this alleged murder. Um, and that's where you sort of learn your redundancy. So in that case, I didn't just have a, a wireless transmitter on him. I also had a second body pack that recorded onto um, onto the mic itself, essentially. Mm-hmm. And we they had to use that one. And it got it. It was really good. But during it, uh, you know, our producer was like, I can't hear it. You know, we need to get this. This isn't this isn't working. The, the audio is cutting out. And I had to tell him, I'm like, I promise. Like, he has a recorder on him. It's it's getting that. But something's wrong with the wireless that you, you just can't anticipate 100% of the time. Yes, correct. Uh, I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> But what about the uh, Kevin the uh, like the special effects? Do you also work on it? Mm-hmm. Um, I have done a little bit of special effects myself, and I've tried to do um, so uh, some camera and f- to hand off for someone else to do special effects. Um, so I, I have like a little bit of insight, but it depends on what you're asking. I could answer it. There, there might be a chance. Yeah. Um... Okay, one more question here, uh, Kevin says here. Uh, what were your uh, initial attempts at uh, filmmaking like? Can you recall the first projects or ex- or um, mm-hmm. experiments that allowed you to dip your toes into the world of uh, filming? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say probably there. Were, I try. I tried doing a few films. I had this sort of can. I had a Canon camcorder, and those first few films, I actually didn't even understand um, like proper frame rates or like exposure in that sense. That um, I used to play. Or I play a lot of video games, so in my head, I was like, "Oh, 60 FPS. Everything needs to be 60 FPS." Um, and I'd always wondered why it didn't look like films. And then that's when. 
you know, I realized, oh, it's in 24 FPS and the shutter, um, they use a 180 degree shutter and I was filming in 60 frames with a completely wrong shutter. Um, and that's kind of how I learned about, uh, just the state, just the literal standard of how films are even meant to look the way they do. Um, and, and it involved a lot of just kind of like funny videos or, um, just, just stupid projects of like, like, you know, they were only like one or two minutes and it was, and there, and it, it was just like one joke, one punchline essentially. And those are the videos that kind of like got my toes zipping and kind of realizing like, Oh, you know, there's a lot of pre-planning that goes into this stuff. They don't just, you know, show up and go, all right, let's film this. You know, they get a script down, they look at the camera angles, they think about editing in mind. That's a huge thing that, you know, you make a lot of projects and then you realize like, oh, I'm not thinking about the edit while I'm shooting. So I'd say funny videos. That's the, <laughs> that's probably what, what started it. So using a mobile phone with a good camera is also uh, advisable if you were, uh, you know, kind of shooting at least uh, some, uh, face-to-face interviews? Uh, I, you can really use anything. Um, and where phones are at right now, there's actually a lot of stuff that um, surprisingly can get captured on a phone. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say like that there's a lot going on right now with the iPhone 15 and like how it, you know, films, tr you know, true log and, or Apple log. And they have like, you know, people are like color grading and it looks really good. Um, so I'd say at, the, at this point, it's a it's a really competitive uh, piece of device at this point. Uh, and I'd probably argue that the majority of content people consume now is from the phone anyway, um, especially with the, like Instagram stories or TikTok or YouTube shorts. Um, most of the stuff is filmed on a phone and then like that $100 mic you can buy <laughs> that clips on, like that's the majority of content. <laughs> Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's you know, pe people have entertaining ideas and that's what people are watching. They're not watching the phone or the, the mic. They're watching the person and what they're talking about. Uh, being in the film industry, Kevin, uh, what are your favorite movies, by the way? Just can you give us like top three, uh, your, your favorite oh. movies? <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a documentary called American Movie. Um, uh, and I love Christopher Nolan. So the other two films I love are Interstellar and Tenet. Mm -hmm. those, are my, those are my top three. Well, our Pre and Prestige, that's also a Christopher Nolan movie. Um, but that's, that's a little bit, that was like one of my original favorite movies. Um, I'd say those are the top three though. Yeah, American Movie is, uh, there's, it's so that one is actually like really inspiring, I think, because it's about, it follows a guy in North Dakota, I think, um, and he's making his own film. Uh, and it's a documentary about him making the film. And he, it's, it, it's really endearing because it goes through the whole process of like, you know, he doesn't have a lot of money. He's like trying to convince his, you know, his mom to help him film something because he's trying to get extras for the film. Uh, and it just, it just follows that story. And it's, 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 I think it's not only is it a really good film, but anyone that wants to kind of like relight the passion of filmmaking, I think it's a good film to watch. Yes. So by the way, Kevin, uh, what about, um, are you guys only shooting within the area or on your state or uh, you get to travel somewhere else? I travel um, most around the Midwest. So um, there's Iowa and then like the surrounding states. That's where I kind of work. Um, so that 21 day thing I was talking about last year, I was actually in Wisconsin, which is about five, five hour drive, uh, some direction. Um, and I stay in a lot of hotels. <laughs> that's the, um, that's that's my life is is, is a lot of, a lot of hotels and like trying to find uh, ways to keep myself entertained when I can't bring like my gaming PC with me. I gotta have like a gaming PC. You know, with you. Yeah, yeah. It's like I can't bring, I can't haul that around. So you know, I gotta find something to keep me entertained on my downtime. Oh yeah, because you also edit uh, after the shoot, right? So. Yeah, I'll, um, so for a lot of the things I work on, I usually just hand off whatever footage. Um, but yeah, I like, I also do, um, coloring. So like, uh, color grading, that's something I, uh, found entertaining to sort of get into. Uh, can you tell us more about the green screen? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so the green, like, do you just kind of want to break down of the green screen, like what it is or yeah. kind of how the process behind it? The backdrop. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. How does it work? Or 
is it just simply uh, just a, just just put a, a green blanket at the back of it and then uh, just uh, use some effects on your computer? And then, mm -hmm. So yeah. essentially, um, like like a green screen is essentially shooting in front of a backdrop that um, is makes it really simple to key someone out. Um, and they discovered that the color green and um, also the color blue are really easy to uh, differentiate the tones between um, a person and and the backdrop in a background. So what they do is they drop a, a sheet of green or blue behind a subject and they do their best to light it evenly. That's a really important part is to light it super evenly uh, behind them. And in the program, you essentially tell it, remove anything that this color. And since you don't find, there's no green in our skin or hair, uh, and you make sure they're not wearing any green clothing, uh, it just, you know, super easy to remove them from, the, from that. And then blue being a secondary, um, also easy color that you don't really find in the skin because, you know, it's, all of our skin is orange on any skin color spectrum it's it, it falls along orange uh they found blue is good uh if you know the person has to have something green on them uh and, and that's kind of the way and, and then you know you have this key essentially and you can put anything behind them and um some people it, it's kind of important if you really want to make sure that the person can fit uh, wherever they're green screened into is that you get a big green screen backdrop and you bring them away from the green screen so that way the lighting that's hitting the green screen to keep it even isn't lighting your subjects and then you can light the subject however you want. Mm, okay, so this uh, green screen, can this be uh, any material or just a specific uh, green screen that uh, we can uh, purchase after the market? Uh, you can do anything. Uh, some people, there's like, if it's small enough, you could even, like if it's like a tight shot, you can just have like a green piece of paper, like construction paper if it's big enough mm. and covers your screen, just put a light on it. Um, and I, I always thought there was a specific material, but every yeah. time I work with someone and they bring like a green screen blanket, it's, it's something else. Um, I'd say if you're looking for something, get something that doesn't wrinkle because, uh, you know, you could light it evenly, but if it's got a bunch of wrinkles, you're going to have problems with the shadows cast or, you know, the lines showing up. Uh, so a non wrinkle material is essentially what you're looking for. So, so it has to be like a really flat surface. Mm -hmm. Yep, and like yeah, you know, those it's a flat surface, and if it's a little bit stretchy, that also helps because it keeps you know again gets the wrinkles out. It's it's all about keeping it even and consistent. Mm, okay, because it's always been a challenge to um, you know I really don't have like a really nice uh, studio like yours right now. Your your <laughs> yes, studio looks really good, a... so kind of thinking about using a green screen and just uh, use a backdrop on my uh, you know laptop because I, I thought it was just like a specific material. Uh, I thought so too. <laughs> <laughs> so anything uh, uh, green, as long as it's flat surface and mm -hmm. or something uh, stretchy, that's all good. Yes, I mean some people even go as far as just paint the wall green. Like it's it literally does not. It, it's really just all about the color. Like that's that's really all the the programs are looking for, and a lot of. Um, built-in programs are really good at keying, even without a green screen. I mean, sometimes, like, uh, I, I don't know if Google Meet, but, like, some of the other ones, like, you can just hit remove background. And you'll see a little bit of artifacting around the person, but it does a really good job, surprisingly. So if you had a green anything, chances are it'll look good. That's really good. Okay, now I know. Now I know. Okay, so, by the way, Kevin, how did you learn these things? I mean, all the technicalities of this... How did you uh, manage to learn all these things? Yeah, um, so I like watching videos about stuff. Uh, I like the technical aspect of it, uh, but I quickly learned that it's not enough. Um, it's all trial and error. Um, you can't, it, it always, everything that someone knows usually comes from them trying something and realizing it didn't work. And then if you ask someone like, oh, how'd you learn this? They'll probably tell you about how they tried it and it didn't work. That, that's 98% uh, of, of all this is trial and error of, you know, you think you, you look at it, you look at something um, and, and problem solving, I guess, is the, is the better term for it, is that there's a problem that you're trying to solve. Um, you want it to look a certain way, um, but how do you get it to look that way? And so with green screen, 
a lot of the times, you know, you do a great, I, I've had, you know, more than enough times that I did a green screen and I thought would work. I bring it in to edit and then something goes wrong. And I go, why did it not go wrong? And then I looked up and go, it just, need, it, I needed to light it evenly. I thought it didn't really matter if, you know, there was a few wrinkles here and there, but like it, the problem really compounded. And then that's, um, you know, and that's where I learned the even lighting thing. And for the materials, you know, again, just working in general, I'd work with other people and, you know, three different people brought three different kinds of blankets with three different looking materials that I was like, oh, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, so it's like, it, it's really about not necessarily working, but, you know, do doing it. That's the, that's the best way. So the light also plays a really a huge part when you're, when, when you're shooting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is there like a really good settings on your light? Uh, I kind of broke lighting down in the sense that like, uh, one, it's, it's probably the most important aspect of um, a, a director of photography, uh, is skill set, in that like most people kind of focus on the camera and the lenses and, and, and sort of that, but they always discover that they needed to learn lighting to get their images looking uh, really good. Um, so it kind of just in this scenario, you can see like, I, I'm not lit really well. And, and even if I had a good camera, it wouldn't look that great. You, you look like more evenly lit, especially compared to the background, it would look much better. Um, so the rule for lighting is that there's two factors you have to, uh, take into consideration. One is the size of the light. And the second is the distance of light to the subject. The smaller the light, um, and this basically just has to do with shadows and harshness. If the light is small, um, it will cast hard shadows. And if the light is far away, it'll cast hard shadows. So to get a nice lighting, most people do is they get a large source and bring it in close. So when you look at most lighting setups, you'll see they'll have the light. The, they'll usually have like some sort of uh, mono light with like a COB and they have like a dome on it. Yeah. Uh, with like a diffusion on it. And, and the diffusion is literally just making it so the light is no longer, the source of the light, if, uh, if we get like technical with it, the source of the light, the source of the light is no longer the COB on the light, but the diffusion becomes the light source. And that's kind of how you have to look at it. So you take a, a and that's kind of when you find out you can use anything to diffuse it. It could be a shower curtain. It could be a bed sheet, um, whatever, the, the latest, whatever material or, or like whatever's there before the light gets to you becomes the light source. So in the, uh, the reason why things look really good uh, outside on cloudy days is that normally on a clear day, the sun is the light source and it's big, but it's super far away. And that's why it's really harsh. Well, on a cloudy day, you essentially have a really big diffusion. So instead of the sun being your source, that's like a million miles away, the clouds become a thousand, you know, are like, you know, so many thousand miles away. And they're, they're now considered the light source and they're much closer. And when it's really cloudy, it's much, much larger than comparatively to the sun. And that's why, uh, so like if you're bouncing uh, light off the wall, the, the source of light is no longer the light itself, but the wall. Um, and, and that's kind of like, that's kind of the way to look at it. If you can make your lights larger or closer to you, you can make it softer. If you want it harder, then you either reduce the size of light or more often than not, just push, push it back. That's kind of like the, um, you can get into like, you know, multiple lighting, like fills, negative and all that stuff. But I, I think the true base, basic of it is size of the light and distance from your subject. Cause you can get a small light to look good. Um, even for you, if you just have like one of those square pocket lights, um, just put like a little pillow sheet in front of it and it'll probably look nice and soft. Wow. That's really clear. I mean, I totally understand now. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a free, uh, lesson. <laughs> okay. To my viewers, guys, if you think that you're, you, uh, you're learning something on this episode, of course, uh, from Kevin, please do like and subscribe. Yeah, I, I like the technical aspect. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very technically minded when it comes to this stuff. So I kind of really, I break it down a little different than uh, probably the same as most people, but there, there's a few ways, like the lighting thing. Um, 
it's like heart people kind of break down hard and soft light, but I, I like to look at it as just size of light and distance from subject. Um, so it doesn't matter what light it is, as long as you work it that way, that's, that's how you can control your lighting. We should mm -hmm. have just uh, enlightened us right now. Oh my. So what about for the, uh, uh, audio, uh, Kevin, what you can, uh, you know, uh, give us the tips for audio. Um, audio, uh, here's the big tip is have someone dedicated to audio working on something, uh, in this, I guess for a film or, um, when you're just working on something on your own, it's, uh, it's one thing you can pass back. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, when you're working on, yeah, when you're working on a project, having someone dedicated to audio is, is super important. Uh, and especially sort of on, on the indie level when you're working on your own stuff, because it, it really has to do with, uh, resources. It, it's really nice when you can have someone that does camera and focuses on buying their own lights and camera stuff, and they don't have to spend money on audio. And you have an audio person that spends their money on the audio stuff and you, you know, cause it's a collaborative, uh, it, it's as much as like the, the more, the bigger you want to get the more collaboration is necessary, uh, for a lot of stuff. So like at home, you know, I can, you know, I have my own microphone and if I wanted to set up a light, I could do that. But the more, the moment it gets into like a film and I have actors, it's, you know, I can't hold a boom pole and get a microphone close to my subject if I'm holding the camera. Um, and, and it's, it really just comes out of that. Like you, someone, the best thing you do is just have someone dedicated to the sound. Mm, because uh, I intend to uh, do my interviews, uh, you know, face to face uh, mm -hmm. in the future. So this is something that I really could not do alone, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, you can. Um, it's it's really a matter of like if you run if you run into a sound issue, chances are the solution will end up being hire a sound person. Um, but the availability of equipment now in this day um, versus like twenty years ago has made uh, the solo um, content creator much more uh, much more powerful and uh, flexible. So again, those little square mics come in. Uh, uh, one receiver and two transmitters. So you can just clip one to yourself and clip one to the other person and you're set. And a lot of those already do like automatic gain staging where it'll set the sensitivity to a good level between the two of you. Um, and that's, that's really all you would need to do uh, for a sound person. Like for a lot of interviews, like I set up, you know, two boom mics and I have like two lav mics as backups and I run it into a mixer and, you know, I'm setting the levels and all that stuff. But um, and, and it's not necessary for a lot of people. Again, it's it's one of those law well, diminishing return kind of things. Because if you're just going to interview people, I'd say you know if you use those square mics, you're you're set. One of my challenges is also the uh, audio mixing. So after the interview, I always have this hissing sound. How do I? Mm -hmm. Is there a way for me to like uh, remove those hissing sound uh, completely? Mm -hmm. So there's. Um, there's a lot of sources of, of noise that you can get. Uh, first is the um, microphone itself it has a noise floor. Um, that's uh, the more expensive mics have like a really low uh, noise floor, which is just like if you listen, to, if there's no sound at all and you listen to the mic, um, there's the room noise and then the microphone noise. And um, the microphone noise ideally is like really low. Uh, but the cheaper mics, you know, it, it's kind of hard to differentiate. Like, am I hearing just the noise of the room or is that the microphone? So you have noise that the mic could be making. Uh, and then there's the uh, noise that the recorder could be making also, the noise floor from that. Uh, and, and, if you're, and if you cheap out, you kind of like, you have the, these noise levels kind of like stacking. So, when you, so that's kind of what that hiss could be. Um, and part of that has to do with... Um, uh, you, you just can't get get rid of it completely yeah. because because uh, there's always something going on. And what you can kind of do, regardless of like equipment, uh, is you can you can there's like denoising software. And what you can do is get what's called room tone, which is just a silent bit of like 10 to 15 seconds of just what that room sounds like when no one's talking. You're just in silence. 
and then you use that and use that as a profile to denoise your video track or not your video track, but whatever interview audio you are using. Um, and that, and that can help uh, reduce the noise essentially. Uh, but the source would be like, for, could be from the microphone. Um, the, the recorder itself, cameras aren't really known for having good mic preamps. Um, and then additionally, uh, the room noise itself, like that's the hiss. Like, like my, if I was silent and I'm sure if it would pick it up, you could just hear like the fan on my computer going, you know, you hear like a, yeah, I do. You know, I do yeah. something like that. So, uh, oh, but it's not, I'd say, uh, I guess a, re- a last note for that is that like, there's nothing wrong denoising it. Like you didn't do anything wrong. If you have to denoise something, um, it, 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 it's just a part of the process. So uh, let's say, so we're kind of talking right now, and then the dog mm-hmm. barked. Can mm-hmm. I remove that dog? I mean, the, the, the sound of the dog barking on my editing. You, you could if, um, so this is also a reason why you get that, uh, at least in film, they'll get what's called room tone, which is like 30 seconds to a minute of just everyone sitting in silence. Uh, because you could isolate where that dog barks, edit it out, and without putting anything in there, you'll hear like the sound of the room and then suddenly we'll get really quiet and then back to that room sound. You take that, you know, bit of silence and put it into that little window where the dog barked uh, and no one would know that you removed it. If someone was talking while the dog barked, yeah. it's a little bit different. Uh, yes. Sometimes you just got to deal with it. Like that's that's the other side of it is there's some stuff you just can't get around. Um and some people go like, oh, well, how do they do that? And the real answer is they just do it again. They re-record that little bit. <laughs> so like for interviews, a lot of the time on some shows that I work on, uh, the person will say like a line and it's good right until the last five seconds. And you'll hear like um, like a semi, like hit a, a, a sign outside. And I'll, and I'll tell the producers like, hey, can we just record uh, the last bit of his sentence? Because there was a loud noise. And they go, okay. And they're like, hey, can you just say like, and that was the day I found this out. And then they'll re-record it, and then they use that part. But uh, is it okay for you to mention about the applications you were using? Uh, for video, I use the Adobe Premiere Suite. So like uh, Premiere Pro, After Effects, uh, Audition. Uh, when I color grade, I use DaVinci Resolve. And then um, I, I use FL Studio when I make music, but I don't really write a lot. <laughs> but th- those are the kind of programs I use. Um, I have a lot of plugins audio wise for stuff. I wouldn't re- really recommend everyone buy because, you know, it's a specific. A lot of them I buy for like a really narrow use case. Uh, but I'd say like a lot of the built in tools in these programs are, you know, can get everyone almost 99% of the way. Uh, Hit Film Express, I think, is one. It's free. Um, that's kind of it edits kind of similar to Premiere. Um, I'd say those that's a a good program to go for. I'm not 100 percent sure in the licensing structure and the uh, if it's much different in the U.S. versus the Philippines, but I mean it's it's an option to at least look at is uh, Adobe Suite um, and DaVinci Resolve. I'd say DaVinci Resolve because you buy DaVinci once and that's it. Uh, Adobe you pay every month and they're getting more and more expensive. So. <laughs> that's well. That's what I ch- that, That's what my childhood used to because you get to pay the uh, application uh, every month. Yeah, it it uh, it all starts to add up now that everyone's doing uh, subscriptions. So I have like a you know just every month just subscriptions coming out. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> DaVinci Resolve. No, I bought it once. I bought it like two years ago. I haven't paid a penny since. So. Okay, Kevin, uh, what else do you think you can, uh, you know, share with us uh, about tips on uh, shooting a, uh, probably a face-to-face interview or uh, on editing? Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say make sure that, uh, so this is, this is kind of like the heart of, uh, I was explaining this to someone earlier, is that the heart of a professional versus an amateur comes down to uh, problem solving. So there's a lot of things that people kind of take for granted and go like, you know, oh, I did it this way, but I, I'm still running into this problem. What do the professionals do? And, and the reality is that the professionals, 
don't do anything magic. They, their solution is a lot more simple than you think. So if you're doing face-to-face interviews and, um, and you want to make sure that it sounds good is to literally go to the location and make sure that there's no crazy sounds happening where you want to film these interviews. Uh, so make sure there's not, uh, you're not near an airport. So there's constantly loud planes going by, yeah. make sure, you know, train station. So the train's not blowing its horn. Um, some people think that, you know, you show up to a spot and it's just like, oh man, how would, how are they getting around, uh, all these planes and trains and dogs barking? It's like, Check. well, 90% of the time they're actually just, they, they, they go to the location first, see that that's a problem and pick somewhere else to do that. Um, same with lighting. Uh, they, uh, a lot of camera people, you know, you, they look at a shot, they want to film, uh, and they look at where the sun is going to be when they're filming to make sure the lighting, uh, is, is in a good spot. Uh, and some people think like, oh, well, I thought it was just down to exposure. It's like, no, it literally comes down to like seeing it first before you go in. Cause if you can remove a problem before you even start, you're, you're going to have a much better time in post, uh, dealing with, um, much smaller problems, you know, and, and that's kind of where like denoising and, you know, the dog barking, so, you know, sometimes dogs are just kind of wherever, uh, and some people just have dogs. <laughs> that's another, that's another thing. Uh, but you know, it, it, it's like things like that. Like you, you, you're thinking like, Oh, is it a program or are they doing something special? It's like, no, they're just either physically doing it somewhere else or, um, you know, it, it, it's nothing, it's no, there's no secret. It's, it's kind of like it, it, the answer is always a lot more simple. Cause again, the heart of this field is uh, problem solving. You're always solving some sort of problem uh, when you're making something, whether it's, it's, whether it's a practical solving an issue or solving a creative thing to make it look a certain way. So a uh, noise free location is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for, for camera, it's, I don't know, really it's, you just look at re- uh, references and see how you want it to look. Um, if you can get a little, uh, if you want, if you want to use one light, cause usually when you're by yourself, you don't want to be hauling a bunch of stuff around. Um, they use this thing called a dome. Uh, that's like a, it looks like a, a lantern or I think it is called a lantern. Uh, and, and you can just have that, put that on your light and then in between your subject, uh, and it'll like, you know, kind of like both of, both of you. And that's kind of how you can kind of do it with one light. Um, that's, that's why it's, sur- I, I feel like I said a lot, but that's kind of like my surface level advice for that <laughs> sort of the interviews. But, uh, well, what about, uh, I don't know, maybe just as someone like me who was really, you know, I really have limited uh, equipment. So I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm even just planning to use my mobile phones, like two iPhones together. Mm-hmm. You know, just a basically a simplest form a- a- as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say the setup I would have for that is um, so I would use that audio wise, I would have the little the square mics. Even though I have one in my kit that, like, you know, I have like thousands of dollars of mics, but then I have this little $100 set and I still use it because it's, it's all about using the right tool for the job. So I would use that for audio and I would go into one phone, um, which would be probably the phone of your subject. And then you'd have the other phone going, uh, cross ways to, uh, to you. Um, and, and, and like, that's, that, that's really all, you, all you'd have is just have the two phones cross. I would do a clean shot. So I wouldn't have the shoulder of, uh, there's like clean and dirty, uh, shots. And that's like dirty is when you have something in the frame other than your subject, usually in the foreground, sometimes you'll notice like shoulders and stuff, of the person talking, I wouldn't have that to keep it clean of both people. And then you just have to make sure you clap, um, when you start recording. So that way it's easy to, to sync the two, uh, cameras and posts. And then, you know, and now you're just swapping back and forth as you talk. Yes, Lighting is kind of whatever, you, you, you know, it depends on what, what you have. Um, that's, that's my setup at least. So if I have mm-hmm. two, uh, two iPhones, I'm not sure how to, uh, sync both of them together. Mm-hmm. 
So um, what you would do is first you need to make sure that the uh, you have to make sure the phones are set to the proper frame rate. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I don't know if it's just the iPhone, but sometimes they'll have this variable frame rate that they do. So it doesn't shoot at 24 flat. It shoots at like 22 frames per second and sometimes 27 frames. I have no idea if that's still an issue, but I did run into that years ago. Uh, so you, first you make sure that those are, um, those are the same. same. And the yeah. next, have you ever brought in, um, like when you're editing, have you ever like dragged in the video file and you see like a line for video, then a line for audio, yeah. and it shows like this waveform mm -hmm. of the sound. So basically, both clips will have that when you drag them in, and then that clap, the person's the clap is you'll see the waveform and then a big spike, and then you line up the spikes on two, on both of those video clips, and then they're synced. Uh, and then you can use the visual of the clap as like a reference to make sure that it's synced. That That's the purpose of the clap. Uh, and you'll see like on films, they'll have like this little clapboard thing. Yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, it, it's essentially glorified hands. Yeah. <laughs> it does, doesn't do anything different than a clap. The board says other stuff, but like for syncing, like the clap is all that matters is that you see the clap in both cameras. So, you know, like if we were about to do this, you know, I'd look and be like, okay, I gotta move my hands here. I'd say, like, you know, interview, take one, clap. And you want to say the interview, like, you know, the take, just in case there's more and you're, like, oh, trying to go through, like, oh, which one was this? Well, hearing the phrase, you know, interview, take two, clap. That's, uh, that's, all, that's all it will take is just look at the waveforms. The clap will create a really narrow spike, and bam, they're synced up. Okay, that's what the clap, uh, clapper all about is. <laughs> what can you advise for those uh, aspiring filmmakers listening right now? Based on your experiences uh, starting out in the industry, what can you advise for, for those folks? Um, I'd say that um, always be a student. Um, you always have to be making, uh, creating stuff and that a network... Um, as much as people hate to admit it, it really is about who you know, but it's not in the sense of like, um, you know, you have to be important is essentially, you just have to make sure you do good work, um, good, honest work with everyone that you're working with. Um, and, and it goes a long way, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a web of people that are all working. We're all getting emails from someone going like, Hey, do you know someone that can do this? And all it takes is just one person knowing like, oh, Kevin did audio on this short film that I did, you know, a few months ago. Let me ask him if he's available. Um, and and that, that's that's my advice is you you have to be creating both for the network and for the, the knowledge. Because you can read as much as you want about a process of, of like, this is how they did it this way. But until you do it, uh, you don't actually know how it works because there's just too many variables that are different than uh, filming. Even even like sit down interviews is like a, having a room with no window versus one window is like surprisingly very drastic on like how you're going to approach like getting it lit, how much power the lights need to be. Are you competing with you know, daytime sun, or is it nighttime where you can get away with like a 60 watt light? If there's the sun, you need like 300 to 600 watts to get the exposure at a good level. Um, and, and, and so that, that's my advice is you have to keep creating both for your network and for your, um, uh, for your knowledge. Because again, I've said multiple times, it's, it's a problem solving. Uh, it, it, it's a field of problem solving. And if you're not running into problems and solving them, then you're not really growing as a as a filmmaker. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. Let's give it up, Kevin Thorne. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>